Okay, I'm with uh, Robert this evening, and we're ready for the chapter of Matthew. And uh, before we get started, uh, Robert, why don't you uh, offer up a word of prayer for us? Father God, Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, I thank you very much for thy word, for thy truth, for thy gospel, for thy grace, for thy salvation, for thy mercy, and for thy Son. And I pray, Lord, that as you have been merciful to us, I pray that we would show that same mercy and kindness and compassion and patience with others, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that thou would give us a heart of forgiveness, a heart of charity, a heart of meekness, and a heart that's filled with the fear of the Lord. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us, help us to decrease, that you would increase in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would be glorified as we study thy word. I pray that Brother Larry and I would worship thee in spirit and in truth. And I pray, Lord, that thou would guide us into all truth and open our understanding to thy word. And Lord, please teach us by thy Holy Spirit. Please increase our love for thee, Lord. Please increase our love for the brethren. Please increase our hope and our faith. And Lord, just help us help us to live as you live, Lord, and help us to be doers of thy word and not hearers only. And I pray that not our will, but thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus Christ's name, our God and Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, brother, uh, you want to go ahead and start with the first five verses, and we'll just continue along? Sure. All right. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was said, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Go ahead. Do you have any comments on that, uh, those five verses? Well, I know that in the Psalms, you know, King David, I believe, he says, uh, a broken and a contrite spirit. Now, those are... Those are what please the Lord, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that's what it says. And I believe that's what he's saying here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And, you know, we read in the book of Job how everything was taken from him. You know, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And though we don't understand during the trials that we're going through, we don't understand always you know, what the purpose is of it, but ultimately the purpose is that if we're Christ, if we're born again of the Holy Spirit, you know, we have fellowship with Him through our sufferings. We suffer and experience the things that He suffers. And Scripture does say, it says, He has been given only to believe but to suffer for His sake. And being poor in spirit also keeps us from being high-minded, keeps us from being uh, full of pride. And then all... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, we're, we're, we are to walk in meekness and be lowly of mind, esteeming others greater than ourselves. And that is completely contrary to what the, the world does, what the world thinks. And what we, what I used to do and what, you know, sometimes I still continue to find myself doing the days that I'm in the flesh and I'm not in the spirit. You know, by his grace, he, he rebukes us. He corrects us. He brings to remembrance the things that we've read in his word by his Holy Spirit. And by his grace, as the good shepherd, he chastens his sheep. Because he chastens those whom he loves. 
and that goes 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 along with what verse four says: "Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted." And we know that the Comforter, you know, Jesus said, "If I go away, I will send you a Comforter." And I believe that Comforter is the Holy Spirit, which I also believe is His Word. And you know, especially in the Book of Psalms, you know, when we're when we're down in the valley, and you know, whether it's the chastening hand of the Lord, whether it's a trial that we're going through, whether it's uh, relationship issues, what you know, whatever it is, His Word is the number one thing. It's the only thing that that brings remedy and that comforts us. So when He says, "Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted." I believe that's what he's speaking about. He's he's saying that we are comforted by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit that is in this book. And when it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now this is this one this one is a uh, I don't I don't completely understand this verse. You know, because I do believe that the earth, you know, according to Peter, we see that the earth is going to be, uh, it's going to be burned up, right? Right. It's going to be destroyed by fire. But there will be a new heaven and a new earth. But when he says, blessed are the meek, which meekness is the fruit of the, fruit of the spirit. When he says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It talks about in Revelation. How we shall reign with him, rule and reign with him in his kingdom. And this is something that I know is a great, um, there hasn't been a, a, a unity of opinion as far as believers go down through the, the years as far as Christ's kingdom. You know, is it, is it, is it currently happening now? Are we currently in Christ's kingdom now? Is it a physical kingdom? Is it a spiritual kingdom? You know, but it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What do you, I mean, what, what, is, what do you believe that verse is saying? <laughs> well, I, I believe that, uh, um, there's two possible, two meanings to it. Um, I, I believe that Scripture tells us to make friends of unrighteous man, and I think that those who are meek, um, often their meekness uh, gains them a great deal of respect by the world. Amen. And uh, I think they uh, oftentimes are are showered with blessings from those um, in the world that they otherwise wouldn't be showered with if they were haughty and proud and vindictive, you know? And then the other thing is, I agree with you that uh, we're looking for new heavens and a new earth where it indwelleth righteousness. And I believe that we are going to, we, we have been given an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, reserved, reserved in heaven for you, or kept by the power of God, ready to be revealed in the last time. So I believe that, you know, we have an inheritance. Um, and Christ said, you know, if I go away, I'll prepare a place for you and come again and receive you unto myself. But where I am, there you may be also in my Father's house or many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And uh, I'm one of those. <laughs> I'm one of those that take that literally. I don't think that, you know, I've heard theologians interpret that in my father's house or many houses or many rooms, you know. I believe I believe that they're, they're mansions, you know. But anyway, that's my thought on that. Um, you know, and while we're here, while I'm talking about this, um, on the first five verses, you know, these all of these terms that he uses, um, whether it's, you know, meek, uh, hungry, thirst, uh, mourners, um, 
merciful, peacemakers, pure in heart, whatever. Well, that all of those terms are terms that most people out there in the world have no interest in. Amen. In other words, I, I, uh, most people don't go seeking after mourners to have a friendship with mourners. Okay. Sure. <laughs> and uh-huh. most people, you know, and, and by the way, that term mourners, um, you know, it, it's, it's used, like you said, in Job. Um, it's used in Isaiah. It's used in Ecclesiastes. It's used in Hosea. Um, do you, do you believe that that's the same morning that, you know, when, when Solomon says, in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increases knowledge increases sorrow? Yeah, I think that's kind of the idea that you find with the prophet Isaiah when he says in Isaiah 57, 18, I have seen his ways and I will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. So there's this idea of one that is mourning how they're going to be, how they're going to be restored. Um, And then also in Isaiah 40 where it talks about, we know that Isaiah 40 is about, the whole chapter is about comfort. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith the Lord. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, you know, and tell them that their warfare is accomplished. Okay. And then also the same idea with this aspect of hunger. Um, I'm not sure. You know, I, I think that it's, uh, I think it's speaking of both, um, physical hunger and spiritual hunger. Uh, because Christ addressed both. You know, he fed, he fed the hungry, but he also, uh, he gave the spiritual food. And then also, um, the, the, in the, the verse that says, I've got to get my glasses back on. I keep taking my glasses on and off, but, uh, it says, <clears throat> Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Well, I agree with you. There's so many passages in, you know, in the book of Psalms that address what is going on here with this sermon, sermon on the mount. I mean. Um, back in, let's go back there real quick. In Psalms, um, you know, the 41st chapter of Psalms, let me flip back to it real quick. Um, he says, um, Blessed is he that considereth the poor, the Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. And it's not just talking about you know, just physical poverty. It's talking about also spiritual poverty. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. He shall be blessed upon the earth, and thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou wilt make him all his bed in his sickness. Thou wilt make all his bed in his sickness. I said, Lord, be merciful unto me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. So I think also mourners, the aspect of mourning has to do with a person's grief over their sin, you know, and and their understanding of their their need of repentance, you know, ongoing repentance in their life. And... Um, and also, I think that there's a this. You know, I've, I've I've studied many people and what they have to say about this chapter five, and everybody has a little different take on it. But when he says, "Blessed are the peacemakers," for 
therefore they shall be called the children of God. We know that not any one person can create peace. I mean, Amen. we don't. But I think what it's referring to, a peacemaker is one who desires peace. That, that in other words, they don't want animosity, they don't want conflict, they don't want contention, and they will do everything they can to steer themselves away from that. Okay, um, I think that's what peacemaker is referring to there. And then also he says, um, "Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven." Notice he doesn't say blessed. Are those who are persecuted? <laughs> okay. He says right. specifically for righteousness' sake. I know a lot of people that you know um, are bullied, you know, are bullied over by other people. Um, but it's not; it doesn't have anything to do with righteousness. Okay, it has to right. do with you know other things. So, but if we are persecuted for our faith and for our standing for the truth of God's word and for our unwillingness to compromise, um, then we are blessed indeed. And uh-huh. and Christ suffered more persecution than anyone else. That's and, right. and he was exalted and, you know, he is now seated at the right hand of God. Of course, that was all ordained by God. But uh-huh. also I was thinking about uh, this aspect of of mourning again, um, you know, in Ecclesiastes, the twelfth chapter, fifth verse says, "Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fears shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets." Um, now I'm trying to apply this to what is going on right now. Uh, I've been watching some of the protests in Canada and Paris, and I've been listening to some of the, the uh, testimonies, if you want to say that, of people and why they are participating in these um, protests. And it's heart-wrenching, some of them. Some of them are, are heart wrenching. I I listened to a testimony this morning of a sixty year old fellow and he says you know, he says, The reason I'm here is I hope that my presence along with everyone else's presence will convince the powers to be to reverse this mandate because he said right. so far it's cost me my job. He was sixty years old, he he'd been at the same place for like over twenty years. It's cost me both cost both of my sons their jobs and it's cost my daughter their job. To make long story short, at fifty thousand dollars per person, that was over two hundred thousand dollars of income that family lost. Okay. Right. And so I think this is what is referring to here in Ecclesiastes that um sometimes when people are being taken advantage of and especially by the government and the powers that be, they end up in the streets, you know, crying out. I mean, they're they're up there at the parliament, in front of the parliament. Where else are they to go right. to seek, you know, <laughs> response? And so, um, anyway, I will uh, kind of turn it back over to you. I kind of ended there in verse 10. If you want to, you know, take up wherever you want to take up from there. All right. No, then also Jesus is, a, you know, he is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief because he is wisdom. Yes. And he is understanding. And, you know, we are to follow in his footsteps. And if we follow in his footsteps, we will experience those same things. And um, I just wanted to read Galatians 4 really quick. Um, Galatians 4, verse 28, Paul says, Now we, brethren as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. You know, and Jesus says, blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for Christ's sake. 
but theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And just as the Pharisees, those that were born out of the flesh, they persecuted those that were born out of the spirit, even so it is today. It's, it is, you have, you have religious, you know, you have the religious persecuting those that are, that are sincere and truly born after the spirit. You know, like the Roman Catholic Church, we see the Roman Catholic Church in the Crusades. Right, right. You know, they per they persecuted the true church because they were attempting to follow their convictions, attempting to, uh, you know, obey this word. And those that were born after the flesh persecuted those that were born after the spirit. And it's the same thing with us. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, is it verse 11? Yeah. Oh, uh, when it says, verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, so they shall be filled. You know, when Jesus says, you know, I know this is a great debate about, you know, with some people about uh, transubstantiation. Uh, you know, he says, he says, Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath everlasting life. And, you know, they were understanding that to be Jesus was teaching cannibalism. And that's not, that's not what he was teaching at all. But they were offended by, you know, this is a hard thing. You know, what are you talking about? How is this man going to give us his flesh to eat? You know, but, uh, but Jesus is the bread which came down from heaven. And he's the word of God. And is it not true that his word is milk indeed and his, and his blood is drink indeed? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, and, uh, and, it's, and it says, you know, his word was given to us as a comforter, which, you know, we just got in reading about the comforter. Those that mourn, those shall be comforted. But that also... The reason why we have this word is so that we can worship God in spirit and in truth. But that also it says uh, in Second Timothy three, Second Timothy three, uh, hold on, Second Timothy three, I believe sixteen. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, uh, it is, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, that the man of God might be perfect thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Where, where, I can't find that. Where's that? Isn't that in 2 Timothy? Oh, 2 Timothy 3. I'd have to look it up. I'm not sure exactly right where it is. Oh, yeah. It's, it's 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we're going to hunger and thirst for his word. Because his word, you know, which Jesus is the word of God. He's the word that was made flesh and was among us. And it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Uh, all right, verse uh, verse eleven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, 
For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Man. And Jesus said, Woe well, unto you when the whole when the world shall speak well of you. For so so they did also of the of their of the false prophets. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its taste, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. So when it says, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. And so when we read that we, believers, are the salt of the earth, well, the salt preserves, right? Right. Right, that's right. And so, is he saying that we're the salt of the earth? We're, the only, the only, is it not true that the only, the uh, the only thing that is preventing the Lord from destroying this earth with His wrath is the fact that He still has His people here, and that He's not willing that any of those that He that He sent His Son for shall perish, but that all shall. But all of them shall come to repent. Right. That's right. Um, I mean, in, in Jeremiah, let me just interject. Um, sure. In Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, Prophet Jeremiah um, is, <laughs> it seems like he's kind of uh, giving a dual message here. He, Jeremiah 17. Yeah, in the seventh verse it says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. Amen. But he goes on and he says in verse 9, we've heard this over and over, the heart is deceitful above Amen. all things and desperate. Look at who can know it. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And then if you go back on back in the, in the next section, uh, he says, um, he says in verse 16, As for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee, neither have I desired the woeful day. Thou knowest that which came out of my lips was right before thee. Be not a terror unto me. Thou art my hope in the day of evil. But then... Now, you know, <laughs> I've, you know, I've often asked myself, how much do we apply the old, Old Testament prophets to our lives today? Because, <laughs> well, look at this verse. I mean, this, this is, Which verse is this is verse 18. He's talking about his enemies. Let them be confounded that persecute me. Let them be dismayed, but let not me be dismayed. Bring upon yeah. them the day of evil and destroy them with double destruction. Amen. Well, you know. I mean, in, in, like the, in precatory psalms, you know, it's like, you know, the psalms are quoted in the New Testament. Right. right. Romans 11, um, you know, Paul quotes, let their table be made a snare. Right, right. And, you know, and I've been told that, well, we can't pray the imprecatory psalms. You know, even though we're commanded to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And as we're going to start, you know, keep reading, you know, Jesus says to pray for our enemies. Right. Right. But. What are we to pray for our enemies? That they be destroyed? You know, I mean. Right. Well, it, it, that's, and that's something that I, you know, and I don't know if I was being childish by doing that. But, you know, there was one time when I, you know, uh. I was just really frustrated and angry with what was happening, you know, with when I began to see all this wickedness. Uh, you know, I put up, you know, well, the Lord said to pray for our enemies, so I'm going to pray Psalm 69. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, and that's, that's a pretty, you know, that's a pretty severe prayer. But I know guys like C.S. Lewis, which I'm not a C.S. Lewis fan, you know, he hated the Psalms, you know, the imprecatory Psalms. Well, and also John Wesley 
hated the Psalms. Right. You know, now, if we look at Jesus himself as an example, um, you know, and I think that if there's anybody that we should follow, I think it would be Christ. Um, right. And I just, uh, you know, what, what, look in uh, the 26th chapter of Matthew. Um, this is when, you know, they were getting ready to take Christ and everything. And verse 59, the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. Okay. I mean, this, this was their modus operandi. They wanted to some way bring him to defame him. Okay. Now, when he says in verse 11 there, Rejoice when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. This this was what was happening to him right here. And, you okay. know, he, he uh, you know, he didn't really... He didn't. He didn't. He didn't take the attitude of Jeremiah here. <laughs> okay. He he could have, like the old song goes, he could have called ten thousand angels. That's right. I love that song. To destroy the world and set him free. Man. But he says here. Uh, look at look at what he says. Well, sixty two. The high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? Verse 63, Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said to him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in clouds of glory. That was his downfall right there, right? That's, right. that's all that, uh, that, that's what God, I mean, you know, that's when he said, do we need to hear any more? I preach, right. I mean, we're done. We're done. Okay. Well, look back and then I'll turn it back over to you. Look back in, uh, uh, back to the Psalms in Psalm 110. Look back there real quick. Psalm 110. We know this psalm very well. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. You know? And he says, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people Amen. shall be willing. I love this. this Amen. Verse. <laughs> Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauty of holiness, right. from the womb of the morning, guys, the dew of the youth. Um, well, right. in verse 5, he says, The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. Right. He shall judge among the heathens. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. Well, you know... We all know there's coming a day of God's wrath. Right. And we know what he says in Psalm 2, you know. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? And so the yeah, Lord's going to... hold them in the Testament. Yeah, and the Lord's going to hold them in derision. He's going to laugh at their calamity. Amen. Okay, so... That's I, right. I'm not... I'm not... Uh, the, the problem He's is... He's going to laugh at their calamity. I mean, that's the Lord. That's Christ. That's right. You, know, you don't hear that today. It's like, no, man, that's, that's who he is, you know. Right. You rejected him, and, and, and you know, he, the uh, you know, those that seek him early shall find him, but there's going to come a time when those that seek him, they'll find him not. Right. And, uh, you know, and they, they did not choose the fear of the Lord. Yeah, and that brings you know, up a question. I, I'd be interested in your take on this, too, Robert, because uh, I've been asked this quite a bit, and uh, I'm not sure I um, know the answer. <laughs> in verse 13, he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost its savor, 
Um, I mean, in other words, if it's lost its saltiness, um, what is that referring to? Is that referring to um, if a person compromises the doctrine of the Bible? Is that referring to a person? Um, I think that. Well, because okay, so can you say that salt is a preservative, but it's also you know you put salt on a wound and it stinks. Right. Um, you know, and and you know some some doctrine does it not sting when you hear it? Sure it does. Sure it does. You know, like the truth of God's word, like the truth of God's sovereignty and election and predestination. Yes. Um, I, I could. Th- I mean, I've never thought about that before, but I I I would I would. I think I would agree with that understanding about um, it's someone that had truth and then, you know, eventually they, they deny it or, or uh, it makes me think about, you know, the, the five wise and the five foolish virgins. Right. I just heard, uh, I just heard a phenomenal message that was sent to me by Tom Adams um, by an old school Baptist, and it was on, on the... Uh, Actually, it's three set of messages. I sent them to you too. You got them. You should have them in your email. But um, it's talking about Vashti the queen, and I never heard. I'd never heard a message like this before. Um, you know, if we believe that God is sovereign over all things, God foreordained that Vashti the queen would not go in unto unto the king before he he caused her heart to be hardened. And by the way, when Esther appeared before the king, he immediately showed favor to her. And anyway, the reason I'm bringing that up is this is kind of what is going on right here with this uh, fifth chapter. That and and, and I I would propose that we stop at 25 verse 25 today because I don't want to cut ourselves short. But you know, right. as he goes, as Christ goes on, notice Christ is, uh, again, he's taking precedence over everyone else. Just look at the red letters. It's all red letters. It's all Christ, right? And he says, he doesn't just proclaim himself to be the light of the world, but he says in verse 14, you're the light of the world. Yeah. You know? That's right. And a city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. Um there, there are people out there that um, stand out um, because of their their unwillingness to compromise in certain things. And because of that, oftentimes, they are, uh, they are ostracized, they're excommunicated, they are, they are, you know, minimized and so on. I think that the light that's shown on a hill has often been misapplied and not <laughs> because this springs out of Christ talking about persecution. Right. It springs out of the fact that he says that if you're in Christ, you're going to suffer persecution. Right. Uh, back in Proverbs, the fourth chapter, um, he says, if I can get to this real quickly. Okay, yeah, verse 18. The path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. But notice the converse of that in the next verse. The way of the wicked is at darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Okay. Um, and so he, he, you know, as he goes on, he, he says in verse 23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a forward mouth and pers- perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot. 
from evil. And so, um, you know, I'll, I'll uh, turn it back over to you. Um, well, and it, it is interesting, too, that right after we read that you are the salt of the earth, it says, you know, I, he says you are the light of the world. And so I believe that he's using, you know, 13 and 14, he's explain, He's using two different terms to explain the same thing. Right. Uh, yes. You know, so we have to we have to believe that he, that salt is like light. Yes. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And, you know, King David said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Yes. And so I can't help but think that this is talking about those um, those five wise and five foolish virgins. Um, you know, they, they both, they both had the word, but, but only, only five of them had oil in their lamp that the word would continue to burn within their hearts, like we read in Jeremiah. Yeah. And, um, and you know, and Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify my father, which is in heaven. And, and in verse 15, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. Now we aren't we aren't to be like that unprofitable servant who buries his talent in the sand. Right. Uh, Amen. You know, we are to we are to desire to take the talent that he's given to us and multiply it that we might have more talent. Uh, was it? One was given five talents. One was given ten talents. And one was given three talents, and the other one was given one talent. Is it? Is that how? It, is that yeah. correct? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then I think about the parable of the sower. You know, uh, very rarely, or I, I've only heard maybe not even a handful of sermons about the parable of the sower. And you know, in this American Christianity, it, it's like anybody that makes a profession of faith instantly they're pronounced saved, regardless of what happens. You know, in, in you know, regardless of, of how the rest of their life plays out, Jesus said, he that endures until the end shall be saved. And, you know, Judas didn't endure until the end. Right. Uh, you know, and, and so, I don't believe that those first three groups of people spoken of in the parables of Sower were born again, saved, blood-bought believers. They couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't have been. Because, Amen. you know, because it, it, it nullifies the whole concept of what is eternal life. Right. You know, God doesn't give temporary life. He gives Amen. eternal life. And right. the other thing is, is that we're told, as as we all know in, in Romans 8, the conclu- conclusion of the matter is nothing can separate us from the love of God. Amen. That's right. You know. Yeah, I think uh, also that the um, it's kind of interesting when you look at um, the Apostle Paul and his instruction, how it lines up with Christ's teachings. You know, and I, um, a lot of people um, I, I have experienced this quite a bit. Uh, there are some people that spend all their time preaching the Pauline epistles, and they hardly ever go through the Gospels. Right. And I've I've often why why are they not willing to teach the very thing that Christ Himself taught? Amen. Because there 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 is no contradiction in Scripture. No, some people not. believe that that Paul taught another Gospel, and that's not true at all. That that's exactly right, and. Uh, I've experienced that. I've experienced that several times where, you know, I'm, by the way, I love the Apostle Paul, okay? Amen. And I, I love this, I love the reading, but I also happen to love Jesus Christ and his teachings as well. Right. And ultimately we believe it was the Lord speaking through Paul. That's right. And Holy, so, Holy you know, and, yeah. and, and, you know, and so, um, I, I'm not a dispensationalist where I believe that, well, the Matthew 5 is for the Jews and it's for another Dispensation, we have, it has nothing to do with us, and uh, you know I don't believe that. I believe that this was first of all when it says uh, I believe this is the law of Christ. You know, we're we're not you know we're not saved by the law. We're 
I, under the law, uh, the law of Moses, you know, I, I do see a distinction, though, where, where Paul says, um, with my mind, I serve, serve the law of, law of Christ, but with my body, what does, it, what does it say? He says, um, yeah. You, 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 you know what I'm talking about, right? In Romans right. 7? Right. And also in Romans, um, 331, you know, all, all these people, these antinomians, there are antinomians out there, believe me. Right. That, that try, there is. That, and and this try, is something. Yeah, they try to speak against the law. Here in Romans 331, Paul says, Do we make void the law through faith? God forbid, yeah. yea, we establish the law. Yeah. You know, these people that say, you know, in other words, Christ is the fulfillment of the law. He, yeah. he obeyed it to every jot and tittle. That's right. He didn't, the law of Moses, right? He didn't come to destroy the law. Yeah. <laughs> okay. He came to fulfill it. And he right. did. I mean, he yeah, did. He, you know. That's right. Someone had to. That's right. Someone had to fulfill it. And it was Christ that did it through the flesh. Amen. Uh, he says, uh, in, in Romans 7, he says, in Romans seven twenty two, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. You know, we're being told that, no, we're not supposed to have anything to do with law. Well, Paul delighted in the law of God. That's right. After the inward man. That's right. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So you got the law of the flesh, you got the law of the spirit, I believe he's talking about here. Mm-hmm. Oh, wretched man that I am. Oh, no, this is Paul. No, I've, I've been told, no, this is Paul pre-conversion. No, I'm, I'm sorry, that's not what it says. He says, oh, wretched man that I am. Not, oh, wretched man that I was. That's right, that's right. He says, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. Amen. Amen. And we know that, Amen. we know that the law reveals to us our sin. Right, because just like James says, you know, whoever shall keep the whole law and offend in one point, he's guilty of all. Amen. I mean, that, so we that's, agree with the law. <laughs> that's right. We, the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Right. Amen. And also, you know, uh, back to this law uh, thing about the law, um, verse 17, think not that I am come to destroy the law or prophets. I'm come to, I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or no tittle in, in no wise shall pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these commandments and shall teach men so, he shall call, be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Do you know, I don't know if you, I don't know if you've experienced this or not, um, Robert, but, um, there are people out there that are teaching people to break the law. I mean, no. I'm, I'm talking about, I'm talking about, the law, the, the commandments. In other words, they're teaching people. It, it, you know, it's all right to steal. It's, a, well, it's, a, it's all right to commit adultery. It's, it's okay to uh, bear false witness against your neighbor. There's people out there that are teaching that. We're not, I, can't help, I can't help but think that that's what Jude was talking about when he says we turn the grace of God in lasciviousness. That's right. And this is uh, exactly what he's referring to here. Because he says, you know, he says, Whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach these, the same shall be called the great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm not one. And and he's not talking here. I want to make sure that people understand. He's not talking here about ceremonial law. Okay. He's not talking about taste not, touch not, and so on. Okay. He's not talking about, you know, 
laws contained in ordinances. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about, and what are the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord thy God with all thy mind, soul, body, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's right. And, and by the way, you know, loving your neighbor as yourself uh, is absolutely impossible without the Holy Spirit of God. Correct. It's just, it's in, because love carries so many different, you know, it's like, I'll, I'll give you an example, you know. Uh, um, when when I when Mark was born, my son, he was born in 1976, and when he was born, it changed my whole thinking about love. It changed everything how I thought about love because, you know, one of the hardest things to do with a child when you you know is to, you know, especially when you're a new parent, is to correct them, okay? And if I saw Mark getting ready to go over and walk over a cliff, I would do everything in my power to make sure he didn't do that. Now, he might get upset because he wants to go there. He, He may throw a tantrum and everything else. But, see, this is the whole thing right now in our culture. People don't want to be held accountable for anything. They all all they want to talk about is freedom, freedom, freedom. Look at that, all the freedom, and look at the vile things they put on the side of those trucks up there in Canada. You know, you uh, one. I haven't seen are the, are the pretty best. Oh, it's terrible. It's most of it's uh, the F word is used all over the trucks up there uh, as it relates to Trudeau. You know, F Trudeau, F Trudeau, F Trudeau. You know, at one time our culture would not even thought about doing that out openly like that. But see, that's right. that's the demoralization of the culture. Right. There's no accountability. There's no, in other words, what's what's the uh, phrase? Do as thou wilt. Well, well and, and it's also like the let's go Brandon thing. Like, I don't yeah. even really like saying that because I know what it's implying. Right, right. But yeah, do what thou wilt. You're right. That's the Alistair Crowley, <clears throat> the Alistair Crowley uh, uh, religion. Yeah. Great. Right. Go ahead, man. Where were we? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I was going to uh, m- mention really quick about how he says, "Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you." So heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And I know that when it says one jot, one tittle, that is like the, if I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, that is like apostrophe, commas, that's like the, the smallest right. portion of the document, right? Right. And... You know, and I think this is going, you know, because Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. And this gets into God, you know, the fact that we have this book in, in our lap, or, uh, and we're discussing it. You know, there's people that don't believe that this book is trustworthy. And man, that really bothers me because it's part of what God promised to his people. He promised to preserve his word. You know, he he said that not one jot, not one tittle will pass from the law. Well, his book is this one. This book right here is, is the law of God. Right, right. And, you know, and people have told me, well, we believe, you know, church, uh, you know, church, church, what do you call it? Church statements, missionary, or what's their statement? Their uh, confession of faith or confession of faith. Right. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been in a lot of churches where. Well, we believe that God's word is perfect and inspired and to be trusted in the original language. <laughs> right. I've heard that too. You know, and I'm like, well, do we have those? Well, no. So, mm. it, first of all, you don't have any scriptural reference for 
such a statement. Uh, you know, but what we do see is we do see in Scripture man's attempt to destroy God's word. Right. But it was always the Lord that, whether it was a, uh, was was a king. What king was it that that cut it up and threw it into the fire? <laughs> king was it? That, uh, king was that? I don't know. But anyway, so, sure. so the, the king hears the word. He doesn't like what he's hearing. Right. So he cuts the, the word of God up. You know, he's he's one of the, he's a Bible critic. He's a he's a uh, you know uh, what he textual critic. You know, you know he's a textual critic, just like these modern guys are. And then he throws them in the fire. But then the Lord just uses Jeremiah to preserve His word, to write His word again. And same thing with Moses. Moses destroyed the original manuscript. <laughs> he receives the law of God from. <laughs> You know, from the Lord, comes down from the mount, and he sees what's going on, and he throws the tablets down, and he breaks it. There goes the original manuscript. But what happened? The Lord rewrote it. Yeah, and the, and real, the real question that you're raising, which is a valid question, and most people don't, don't believe this, and the, the question is, does God have the power to preserve his word or not? Man. And he has preserved the authorized King James Version, Amen. Along with others, the Geneva Bible, the Tyndale Bible, right. uh, over the years, and you know, I, ha- I was on the, I was on the, uh, talking with someone the other day, and it just shocked me. Um, the person said that he did not believe. And this person says he's reformed. This person says he's reformed. He said he did not believe that the Authorized King James Version was inspired, inerrant, or infallible. And he said, the reason that I, I have to take that position is because, now here was his, here was his uh, reasoning. The translators committed gross error in the original Hebrew language. We know we have no original Hebrew language. Okay, that's another, that's for another time and another place. But, um, the point is, I, when I was talking to this person, you know, I ask him the question, you know, does God, Almighty God, have the power to preserve his word? I mean, we've had this word for over 400 years here in the United States as a primary, um, as a primary communication link between God and man and the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. And not only that, we have demonstrations in his word. Right. That he that he, that he is in the business of preserving his word. Yeah, that's right. So it's not a foreign thing. You know, it says in Psalms twelve, the words of the Lord are pure words. Right. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. You either believe that or you don't. That's I right. believe it, and I believe that I have proof that this is what that means. Right. And I, 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 it's amazing. And, and by the way, that's pretty much the genre that's coming out of, of most, I use the word cemeteries, where people get their death certificates because they are, they are taught to question the infallibility, the inerrancy uh, of God's word. Um, and it's just, it's sad. And then that, that gives them the justification to go seek it somewhere else in all these new versions and everything. Right. Um, yeah, I've, I've heard about people that go into seminaries fully believing the Word of God, and they come out like a practical atheist. Yes, that's right. They And the Roman Catholic Church has infiltrated the, the seminary. Yeah. Well, in verse um, 19, he says... It, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men, he shall be called the least. And then in verse 20 he says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. It's so interesting because if you look back in the parallel passages in the 23rd chapter of uh, Matthew, um, it's just, it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, <laughs> I don't know. You know, anybody, anybody that reads this 
would have to say they would they would have to ask them they would have to ask themselves the question you know was was Christ demonstrating love here okay now he says in verse 23 Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you pay tithe on men and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought to have been done and not leave the other undone. You blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but wherein, within, they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind right. Pharisees, cleanse first that which is within the cup and flat on the outside, then may be clean also. And he has all these woes. He calls, That's right. them, he calls them whited sepulchers. He, call, he says, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. Yeah. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Um, you know, and, and I was thinking about this. In Ecclesia, you know, I've gotten in trouble for saying this, but I'm just trying to be consistent with Scripture, and I don't believe that any Scripture contradicts other Scripture. Right. And I believe the only safe way to understand God's Word is by comparing it to itself. Oh, I agree with that. And in Ecclesiastes 3, you know, you got King Solomon, who is the wisest man to ever walk this earth outside of Christ. And is it, you know, it's no, it, it's, uh, it doesn't surprise me that he, you know, that we could read what he wrote and, and come to an understanding possibly of what we're seeing here in Matthew 5 as well as in Matthew 23. Uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Give me a second. It says, uh, verse 1, In everything there is a season. A time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. So, is, is this still applicable today, what, what, what Solomon said? Absolutely. Because obviously, Absolutely. Because obviously this was written before the law of Christ was given. But if you read that, you know, because people are going to have a hard time. I've had a hard time. You read Matthew 5, love your enemies. We, we see Jesus over here talking to his enemies saying, you serpent the generation of vipers. Right. Now, um, but he, but he, I can't took, he took a whip and drove the money changers right out of the temple. That's and, right. And, you know, yeah. that was the that was a great uh, expression of his love for his father. His his love Amen. for his father exceeded his love. Uh, and by the Amen. way, he does not love his he does not love the reprobate. Amen. Okay. Right. Now we, I think we are commanded to love the reprobate. Okay. In other words, Christ has a right to hate the reprobate, but we are commanded to love them. That's right, because we're we're because we are sinless in and of ourselves. That's right. We are not righteous. We are not perfect in and of ourselves. That's right. And neither are they. And we know it is the Lord that maketh thee to differ from another. That's right. And I agree with that. Uh, you know because <laughs> because. Uh, you know, because we're also to forgive others that the Lord himself isn't necessarily going to forgive. That's right. Right? But we know that if we don't forgive others, we ourselves will not be forgiven. That's right. That's right. You know, we need the Lord's forgiveness, so therefore we forgive others because we know what's been done for us 
and we turn around and desire to do it to others because we're grateful to the Lord who first forgave us. Well, you know, yeah, that's the question is, you know, they came to Christ and asked him, how how many times should we forgive our brother? Amen. And he said 70 times 7. And he didn't mean stop at 491. <laughs> that's right. Amen. That's right. And by the and way... I also, I also don't... But do you understand forgiving your brother as if he asks for your forgiveness and he repents? I don't I don't believe that we are obligated to forgive those that don't repent. I agree or, with that and also I don't think we're obligated to forgive those that that are um in other words, just because someone says I'm sorry if I offended you and they keep on offending okay, in other words, if they say I'm sorry if I've offended you and then three minutes later, they're 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 out um, maligning you. Okay, that that's a pretty good sign that they haven't been repentant. Right. You know. And so the, the other issue is, and this has come up quite a bit uh, for me over the years. Um, and I, I, it's a deep subject for such a shallow mind as mine. But anyway, what? What is the distinction between forgiveness and forgetting and remembering? You know, because Christ talks about this. He said that he's cast our sins as far as the east is from the west in the sea of his forgetfulness. Now, only the, this is my position on that. Uh, you've heard that, now this is a secular saying and you've heard it, you know, First time, um, the first time my fault, the second time your fault, right? <laughs> okay, in right. other words, and then the, the idea of, th- this gets down to this, this whole aspect of, uh, no fault divorce. I mean, this is a lot of stuff here we're getting into, but you know what? All men, like you said, all men have, have, have turned away from God. There's none righteous, no, not one. And when someone is in in sin and then they go to someone and says, you know, I I have to apologize to you. I'm sorry I've done this to you and so on. Uh, Only the Holy Spirit can grant us to forget, to forget and to, to move on. But the problem is, is, I've experienced this over the years, and it's not very comfortable to talk about. <laughs> okay? It's not very comfortable to talk about. But I've had people <clears throat> that have asked for my for- forgiveness, and I've given them forgiveness. And a short time later, they just like chop my fingers off. You know? And then, you know, then that, you know. And so that's, that's a tough one. That's a real tough one, especially when it comes to, you know, you talk, you, you alluded earlier to relationships, you know, relationships, especially within the household of faith. You know, they used to have a saying, and, and I think they're still using it, you know, keep your enemies closest to you. <laughs> okay. In other right. words, that way you can find out information. Listen, I want my enemies as far away from me as I can get. <laughs> That's right. Right? I don't want them right. close to me. I don't want to know anything about my enemies, really. Now, right. that brings up another question, and I don't want to get too far off the track, but, you know, and I, I've covered this this morning in the devotional this morning, but if we spend all of our time on exposing the enemies, whether it be you know the Jews, the Jesuits, Satan himself, and we don't proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in its fullness, yeah. something's wrong. Something's wrong, man. I mean, I, I was sharing this with Walt. I know he won't mind me sharing this. Um, just last night we were on the phone, and and I said, Walt, I said, I did not 
I was not born again by understanding history. Uh-huh. History did uh-huh. not cause me to be born again. I was not born again by knowing all about the Masons or knowing all about the Illuminati or knowing all about the Jesuits or knowing all about the the Jews. I was born again by the Spirit of God when I started reading His Word and His Holy Spirit showed me I was a, I was a sinner in desperate need of a right. Savior, right? And so I'll get off my high horse. <laughs> well, that's, that's absolutely right, you know. Um, you know that's something that, I, that I'm that i guilty of. And, you know, may the Lord forgive me. And, and he, I pray that that would be our number one thing that would always be on our mind, that would always be on our lips when we're sharing, you know, God's word with others is, you know, why, what, you know, why Jesus? Why is he the only way? You know, what separates Christianity from every single other religion of the world? And it's the gospel, it's the cross. It's the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Well, that's, uh, that's absolutely right. You know, um, as you know, I, I, about four or five years ago, I, I, I don't know, God would wake me up in the middle of the night and he would give me these poems. I would just write this down and it would just come to me. I believe it was the Holy Spirit. I don't believe, I'm not, I'm not saying these are divinely inspired or anything like that. What I'm saying is, but I want to read this, this, and I've read this numerous times on, on on the broadcast and stuff, but this is entitled, Why? Why would Christ care for a sinner like me? Why would he love me before the foundation of the world? Why would he suffer and die on the cross? Why would he pay such a tremendous cost? Why would he promise to come again for me? Why would he send a comforter while I await his return? Why would he love me forever and never from me turn? He did it because he loved me, not because of any good that I would do or have done. He did it because the Father gave me to his Son. He did it because of an eternal pact between the three and one. This love I will never fully grasp or understand, but love answers the why. It was his eternal plan. You know, I, I it's the most marvelous, wonderful thing to have experienced the grace of God. And I... By the grace of God, I will share. I will share that until the day I die. You know. So. Well, where are we, brother? Uh, I think verse twenty. Okay. You know, I just want to add one more thing to verse twenty. It says, "For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no no case enter into the kingdom of heaven." I remember the first time I read this verse. I was like, what? I was like, that is crazy. Like, I have to, man, I've got some, I got some, you know, I, I got some, some doing to do. I got some work to perform here right. because, you know, my, my righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You know, and that's how I, you know, in my right. infancy, that's how I read this verse. And I was like, you know, this is a tall order, you know, like, I got to get to it. Um, you know, and that, you know, me leaning on my own understanding, me, understanding interpreting one scripture and negation to, to others you know but then i read philippians 3 and it all made sense to me once i read philippians 3 uh, what jesus was saying here yeah you know because in philippians 3 uh you've got you've got apostle paul who himself was a pharisee so you know jesus is saying accept our righteousness exceeds that of the pharisees we will in no wise, you know, enter the kingdom. And so who better to learn from of what this means than a Pharisee? Right, right. Right? Right. And uh, let me go to uh, Philippians really quick. Uh, Philippians. He says in Philippians 3, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. 
Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Our boast is in Him, and His righteousness, and His holiness, and in His blood, and in His mercy, and His grace. We are not as Lucifer did, saying, I will, I will, I will, I will do this, I will do that. You know, did we not cast out devils in your name and prophesy in your name? Did many mighty works in your name? That's not our boast. That's not our confidence. That's not what we're trusting in. We're not trusting in our works. We're trusting in Jesus Christ and his righteousness. It says uh, in verse 4, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. He's saying if anyone could have could have took took refuge and trusted in themselves that they were righteous, like the Pharisees did and despised others, I would have been the guy to do it. And these are my credentials. He says, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. I mean, that's that's that. This guy's got some serious credentials, right? And, but then he says, "But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ? Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ." And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Mm. That's the righteousness that we need, that that's above the Pharisees. And that's what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 5. Amen. Unless we have that righteousness, unless we are, are washed by the blood of the Lamb, and... And, uh, you know, and unless the Lord sees his perfect and holy and righteous son in us on the day of judgment day, well, the greatest thing that we have to defend us is filthy wreck. That's it. Well, you know, that's, I think that's a real good place to stop our study and maybe we can pick up the 21 Amen. because I'd like to stop on, on that note because that's, that's, uh, beautifully uh, expressed by Paul and your reading that was very timely in that, you know, we, we have nothing in and of ourselves to boast. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's really interesting. Sometime I would like to maybe, um, do a, a broadcast on the difference between imputation and impartation. Mm-hmm. You know, because there's a lot of people out there that, you know, they absolutely are convinced that they have, well, their own holiness. Right. And the problem, right. the problem is, is that you, you just stated what Paul had to say about the, the subject and his own struggle with the flesh. But yet, if I had to, if I had to trust in my own holiness or my own uh, perfection or my own uh, progress, as it were. I would be defeated on a daily basis. Amen. That's but right. because I'm trusting in the imputed righteousness and the precious blood of Christ, it gives me hope. Okay. Amen. Um, well, I've really enjoyed this time together, and uh, there's so much that we can learn from this. You know, and if anybody wants to... If they would ask me, you know, do I have any kind of materials? I would, I would recommend go to uh, get Arthur Pink's book on the Beatitudes. Uh, it's phenom- right. it's phenomenal. But there's nothing as good as the Bible. Period. The, right. Bi- the Bible speaks volumes over Pink or anyone else. So right. anyway, um, well, listen, brother. I hope you have a good uh, day tomorrow. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you. And by the way, we're going to, uh, I had a, some correspondence earlier today, or yesterday, I think. Can't keep my day straight. Uh, with uh, day on. And we're going to continue our studies in Ephesians starting Tuesday night. We're going to, I'm going to go back to 30 minutes instead of an hour. 
I'm getting myself on overload <laughs> on some of these, but we're going to try to keep it at 30 minutes. Uh, it'll be Tuesday night, and it's going to be at 6 o'clock, or 6, uh, okay. 6, 6.30, I think. I'll check. But anyway, uh, Dayon and I are going to continue. So anyway, have a, have a blessed evening and a blessed week, and we'll, we'll see you next week. You too, brother. All right. Good night. Good night.